lot of passion for what you're doing. This rings true because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person would give up. It's really hard, and you have to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you don't love it, and if you're not happy with what you're doing, you're gonna give up. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of John's Entitled Podcast, a partner of MoshPitNation.com. This episode's guest is Scott Bowling. Scott, for some of you who may not be aware, has an awesome webcast over on YouTube called Good Company with Scott Bowling, where basically he interviews musicians and uh, basically musicians, and they, he invites them into their house and runs through their discography and gets really interesting stories out of them. And someone I always invite into my computer screen, into my home, to talk to every week is Mr. Daniel Terry. How are you doing this evening? Oh, man, I am doing fantastic. This is a fun conversation. I can't wait for everybody to get to hear it. You know, it, it was kind of fun getting to talk to someone that's sort of, I'll say it, in the industry. Um, I yeah. mean, this is definitely like a, a how the sausage is made kind of a conversation, I think, like... It went from being an interview, like where we were kind of talking with Scott, to really just kind of a roundtable discussion of how, you know, we all do our shows differently, you know, like between you having your show, Scott having his own, like where he has literally has the person on and films it. And then yeah. to, you know, me where I think that's the funny thing is like I, I the Venn diagram between the three of us and our shows is actually pretty interesting. It's like I talk to we talk to musicians on here and you know, as it's such, mostly just you. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, when you when you get a different job that will allow you to actually take breaks. <laughs> when you schedule interviews, you know, after five p.m., that'd be amazing. I'm, I'm at the mercy of these guests. <laughs> I know, man. They're they're busy folks. Yeah, I get it. Um, but with that being said, though, you know, I get to talk to these these artists and so forth, and talk to them about you know new records coming out or various things and you go through a band's discography and scott actually has the musicians there to his house to talk about their discographies and the stories that you know come from that so it was kind of fun you know having him come on and just kind of shooting the shit really about everything and um i know like he's been on your show uh to talk about bride which is a band i knew absolutely nothing about had never heard anything about and i i gotta say i had a really good chuckle when he kept talking was what was the the one album he kept talking about oh a fistful of bees fistful of bees (laughs) like all i could think of was the uh the album cover for was it attack of the killer bees b-sides yeah yeah yeah, and I kept thinking of that, and then I just started thinking of, like, Wu-Tang Killer Bees and shit like that, and I was thinking of everything other than what you guys were talking about, and I was like, man, this album must be really good if it's the one Scott keeps talking about, and I checked out, like, two songs, I was like, this is not, I don't like this. <laughs> it's, it's it's really not good. You should have checked with somebody before you just listened to that. I would have rather have been stung by a fistful of bees. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that was the whole point. It was to create a feeling. <laughs> it created something. <laughs> dude, fifty year old dudes laying down some sick raps. Uh there definitely to some edgy rock music. There doesn't need to be that ever. <laughs> That's pretty harsh, but totally on point. Yes. But uh no, I mean Scott for a lot of us I think uh in the collection of podcasts between myself to me, I would even say like Roach Coach and a handful of us, like, you know, we're all kind of very aware of each other um you know and kind of support what each other does and all that kind of stuff and i would almost say like we form sort of like a collective of sorts between a lot of these podcasts or in scott's case a webcast and so it was kind of fun just to kind of do something a little different kind of break the the mold of what we typically do on here you know talking to a band person or whatever and and all that and uh you know it was fun and you know it may be a conversation that some people find very not interesting because you're just not in this but i think for those who have a an inclination to want to do this or you know do do this yes i said do do um <laughs> uh it's one of those things that i think uh i think there's some interesting information in there i mean especially on scott's behalf like if i mean it's like pulling tea sometimes to get people to come you know come on the show on on this show and, and dan can assess to come on his show as well 
And the thing that killed me about it was, you know, Scott's like, yeah, I just tell people, you know, I'm, I'm available on this one day a week, basically, and uh, you can come over to my house. <laughs> it's like, yeah. get the fuck out of here. I think at one point I was like, how do you get anybody then? Yeah. <laughs> like, if I were to, yeah, I think you use me as the, the sacrificial, like, example, like, where you're like, yeah, I mean, like, John doesn't just go like, hey, come into my office and let's have a conversation. <laughs> right. My office that's a broom closet. Yeah. 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 So... Uh, it was it was pretty interesting though having Scott on, and um, I think uh, without further ado, we're gonna get into our conversation with Scott Bowling. Yes, that's right. We, as in Dan, was in on this conversation as well. So oh let's, my gosh, let's get to it. So welcome to another episode of Johnson's Title Podcast. I have the pleasure this evening of being joined by the quaffed-haired Mr. Scott Bowling. For those of you who may not be aware who he is, he has a great, uh, we'll call it a webcast, uh, where he, good company with Scott Bowling, where uh, he has people of all walks of life in the music industry uh, come to his house in his man cave, and he interviews them, and it puts every podcast uh, to shame. <laughs> it is professionally shot. It looks really great. You can't help but look at everything on his walls. I think he should just start charging admission to his house uh, at this point. But with all that aside, how are you doing this evening, Scott? I'm doing great. Thank you, uh, and thank you for calling it a web show. I'm starting to get like this weird like people. Are, I love your podcast. I'm like, it's not a podcast. It's a web show. See, I yeah. listen to the. I listen to. <laughs> I actually listen to the interviews sometimes. I've got YouTube uh, red, so download the video and listen to it on my phone with headphones on and not have to be not even watch the video. And it, in, in that particular case, I just make it into a podcast. I've almost thought about taking the audio and just starting a podcast with, and just using the audio every every interview. Well, you sure. would almost be doing exactly what I do, which is I typically just take the audio break it all down into a like in uh iMovie or whatever and then basically convert it for YouTube specifically. So I do the same thing just in reverse of what you would be doing. That's cool. Yeah, you just uh uploaded an interview with uh Kevin Max. Yes. Uh, yes. Just recently. I'm almost done with that one. Uh <laughs> it's about an hour long. But uh but good stuff. I remember making fun of his hat for some reason <laughs> just because he's got like a He's got a bowler hat on with, uh, with uh, Feather. like feathers coming out. Is it one feather or two feathers? And like I'm uh, making fun, but it's like it's just because I could never pull off that hat. But I mean, if you're Kevin Max, you could pull it off. Yeah, he actually wants to do another um, interview, but just focus on his solo albums. Cool. Which, uh, yeah, it's cool. I mean, I know a couple of them, but I don't know all eight hundred of them. So, right. <laughs> well, it may be a little hard to do an interview just about your solo stuff. You right. got so many solo albums; it's insane. So, where did the idea first start for for a good company with bowling? So that's a great question. Um, originally, I it was all in my in my brain because I was like, I, I love podcasts, and um, I, I was like, you know, I want to do something like this, but I was kind of shy and embarrassed and be like. Hey, even before I told my wife, I told one of my best friends, uh, excuse me, his name was Kurt Thomas. I said, I want to do like a podcast and just interview people, interview musicians. And he's like, well, you know, you got such an awesome bar and everything. You should film it. And um, he's a, a country artist and he's got a few videos out. And he goes, let me hook you up with the, the guy that does all my music videos. So I was like, that's cool. So it, I kind of, um, so we kind of all set up the interview, and I actually interviewed my my friend Kurt Thomas, and, and um, it's kind of cringeworthy to watch. <laughs> it's, it's like I didn't know what I was doing, <laughs> but uh, I'll just say this real quick. A key thing though is Kurt told me this. He said, "Keep doing what you're doing. You're doing great." And he kind of built me up way more than he should have, because <laughs> going back and watching, I'm like, dude, I suck. But he was. 
it be it, it could have gone two ways because he could have gone like yeah i don't know if this is gonna work out <laughs> but he <laughs> he actually built me up and i'm like because you built me up i did another episode <laughs> as if yeah so i always thank him for that i'm like because I, I listened to what his feedback so if he if he told me i sucked i would probably not start a good company um he has a show he has a song called good company um, so I actually asked him, I said, you know, I love that song you do, Good Company. Do you mind if I use that for the title of the podcast? I'm, I'm calling my show a podcast now. For the, <laughs> for the my web show. So he said that that was fine. So that's basically how it started. Well, I mean, it must not have, it must not have sucked too bad because uh, for a YouTube show um, that, that was just started, you know, kind of basically came out of nowhere. Um, you got a, a pretty good amount of subscribers off of that. Was that, did you notice that early on or was it, uh, was that more of like, like after maybe you got some of the higher profile artists on there or so did that come right away, I guess is what I'm asking, or was yeah. it just based on kind of the artists that you got on? It didn't come right away actually, but what came right away actually was, um, um, a guy named Eric Rogers and he used to be in a band called Stereo Mud. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I kind of Facebook stalked him, and since I had Kurt Thomas's interview, I was able to have actual pictures and in the, the the interview, obviously, and and just something to show for it. So Eric Rogers was like, "I got a new band called My Therapy, and um, so I'd love to be on your show." So it just kind of a snowball effect. So once I had Eric on the show, more subscribers. And then I kind of reached out the phones for Suck Mojo and said, hey, look, I got Eric from Stereo Mud, and, and this is a legit show. So it kind of started from there, and more subscribers came. But it was really getting that first couple episodes and having something. So you're not saying, hey, you want to come to my basement and <laughs> let me <laughs> film you? And let me ask you some <laughs> questions about music? So. Well, that was part of my next question, too, is how hard is it to – how hard is it to, to can, like, because, you know, you're saying, yeah, I Facebook stalked this dude for a while and I was, you know, talking to this person. So then it's like, hey, I know you've never heard of me before, but I want you to come do my show, but you have to come to my house. And, yeah, exactly. And, you, I mean, can you, like, John especially, like, can you imagine if we were asking people, like, hey, we're going to need you to actually show up in person for this at our <laughs> residence? Um, you know, did, did you... You know how how did that go over? Did you or did you just like create the perfect pitch for getting people to come to your house? That's funny that we keep saying my house because honestly, I never call it my house. I just say, "Hey, do you want to come do an interview?" And I say, "This is the location." And usually, that's like the. It's funny because that's like the last thing they find out. They're like, "Oh, you actually live there? That's not a studio." They always think it's a studio. That's but I never call it my house. I just say, "Hey, we film in North Georgia." And uh, I kind of give them, I kind of, I'm just naturally do it that way. I never, I didn't plan on doing it. <laughs> never plan on saying, hey, it's not our house, it's a studio. But they always assume it's a studio, and that's kind of last minute. But by the way, I live here. <laughs> <laughs> it's where the magic happens. Why aren't you wearing pants? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, it looks like too. Um, one of the one of the first ones I watched was the uh, Michael Sweet from Striper uh, interview, and I've noticed, um, and, and I, I feel a little bit of kinship to your show um, with with my other show, Discography Discussion, because I realized that it's not a uh, it's not a Christian rock themed show necessarily, but it is. Um, it, it seems like you know there's quite a few Christian artists featured on there was that something that you ever thought about or do you just have a list of people regardless of whether it's christian music or not that you just want to get on that's a great question i actually uh, um it, with my inexperience i guess i i reach out to people who i grew up listening to and my brother um listened to a lot of christian music growing up so like pod he got me connected like not connected he got me listening to the brown album and i've been a fan ever since so I reached out to them with Striper the same way. Um, just having someone, an older brother who's five years older than me, I, I looked up to him. So whatever he listened to, whatever he liked, I liked. So, And so I never wanted my show to be a Christian show. I never wanted my show to be like a metal show. So I really want to interview anybody and everybody. Um, but yeah, that's so 
And so you'll see like little Christian R sprinkled in because it's basically who I grew up with. One day I think if I get um, if I get uh, better at my craft, I can um, interview a bands I've never even heard of. So, so I'm just kind of playing it safe now. Like, oh yeah, I grew up with those guys. Get them on the show. Heard That's of it. them, so you got to print up like little props to hold up for their album <laughs> covers. What is your process like for preparing for these interviews that you do? It's it's intense, really, because I I just uh, getting all the props is another chore, and now I'm like, is this should I change the format because it's becoming a pain? But no, I, I get props made, and, and for people that don't know what I'm saying, when I say props, I, I I have their vinyl records. If they have vinyls, I'll hold their vinyl records up and say, hey, this is. This is the album you worked on, but if they don't have vinyl records, I I get these things called props. So I go to like uh, FedEx basically, and I hand them a CD, and they'll laser print that CD to a twelve by twelve that looks like a vinyl. You've never had any issues with copyrighting things, like where they won't do it. Um, that's a <laughs> that's pretty funny. Um, and, and nobody's ever asked me that. Yeah, I, I had to uh, I had to uh, yeah fill out a form. <laughs> I don't know how legit that form is. I mean, if you're if you're not selling yeah. it, I guess it wouldn't be an issue. Yeah, I wasn't. Yeah, they they get they FedEx does definitely give you paperwork to fill out, and I kind of just sign whatever. And yeah, this, here's your form. <laughs> sure, I got copyrights on all twenty five of these artists. Yeah, <laughs> but no, yeah, I, I, I basically when they saw me bugging them every day to get more and more done, they I think they knew that I wasn't gonna cause any trouble <laughs> so, um, but yeah so the, preparing is, is another thing yeah I have to I basically listen to music uh, like for a couple of weeks I'll just listen to nothing all the albums and try to get re-familiar with them and and I never write any questions out I just try to get real familiar with the music again so, yeah that's it I, I don't write any questions out I've never done that before maybe mm -hmm. I should what what do you do for like when you have someone like let's say a Jose Mangan or a Eddie Trunk, you know someone that basically does for a living what you have them there to do? How hard is it to interview the interviewers? So that yeah, that's great, man. Um, so those tend to be more the stressful. Like I stress on those hard because. Uh, but what I've learned is I've I've interviewed Eddie Trunk and I was so nervous for that interview because exactly what you said. I'm like he doesn't have like a list of albums he's done so I'm, yeah. um but what i've noticed is that eddie trunk is such a pro i mean he's been on this 35 years I, I remember telling my wife i was like this is the easiest interview i've ever done because he knows what he's doing he's like a pro i'm just like a i'm a little guy you know <laughs> he kept the thing he kept the interview flowing i was like that's the, probably the easiest interview i've ever done same with jose um i can't wait for that to come out um so i interviewed jose and then we did another segment the same day with rich ward from Fozzy, and we talked about 90s metal, and having those guys on the, the show is super easy because they just, they're, they're pros, man. They know what they're doing. They don't, there's no filler space. It's just like they keep the thing flowing. Uh, you know, it's the, it's the other artists, it's the, the lesser known people that are, that are more nervous and, and try, it, it's, it's, those are the harder ones for me. But I've, I've realized. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I know sometimes uh, with publicists reaching out to me to, I'm not going to say break their band, but be, they know that I, I guess in theory, I don't know this for a fact, um, that they know that I will get a good interview out of out of this person or this band uh, that is newer. But the problem I always have is like in trying to do my research, I tend to find that like there's this band Earth Groans that when I was shop them they had just signed to solid state and hadn't really done any touring basically solid state re-released their ep that had already been out so there wasn't even like a solid state debut at this point uh that was new music and there were like no interviews from this band and so it was just like wow this is really tough because i don't i don't necessarily know what to ask that's not super cliche but I guess I kind of have to be the cliche interview and ask certain things because there is no other information out there about this band. So sometimes I think it's easier at times to talk to people that maybe don't have this long lineage of, of information that you can find because mm -hmm. it, you can just break it down to its most basic of like, Hey, where are you from? What, how did you get started? So on and so forth. 
But on the yeah. flip side of that, like sometimes people be like, "Well, this interview sucked." It's just basic questions, and it's like, "Well, I'm sorry." Like it, somebody has to kind of create the foundation for other people to then be like, "So I heard in this interview you did a while ago, blah 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 blah," and that's the hard part of some of that. And so I think it's kind of a, a nice challenge at times, but sometimes I'm like, "Man, I really don't want to be the the one that is like breaking in this band in interviews." Plus, sometimes you get, and I, you know, this is a question for you: Do you ever get anybody yeah. who just? is it good on their feet? I guess it's a different medium because you're not doing it in a typical, like, quote-unquote podcast realm. So you're probably sh- filming, and I'm sure you just cut together all three, like, three or four different angles that the camera's got. But, I mean, like, are there ever, like, really long pauses where you got someone who just isn't a talker <laughs> and doesn't know how to answer questions because they're just not used to being interviewed? Um. Uh, yeah, that's funny. Um, so I've had maybe not the awkward pauses and stuff and i obviously i can't say who but there, there's been i remember one interview in particular where um the person looked a little nervous and and when i asked him a question i started the interview and he immediately uh, summed up the band in about a sentence it seemed like, <laughs> and he got real quick and then and, and that's what we're doing now and i was like all right, well, we're going to have to go further back. <laughs> we're going to have to spend a little more time, you know? Right. But yeah, I've never had any kind of awkward, and not yet. Um, there's uh, certain people, i got a, a few artists coming up, but uh, I've been warned about uh, one in particular that gives, uh, that, that may that may happen. So, uh, yeah, so I could better answer that later in the future. <laughs> what about you guys? What do you do, man? What's the secret? Well, for me, the secret, secret? <laughs> the, the secret for me is Joe uh, on my other podcast. Uh, he makes all that stuff disappear. Like if it's real awkward, like we we had a really bad interview with an artist a while back that was like ninety minutes of long pauses. Oh weird, yeah, that's what I'm say. yeah, and just it just didn't work <laughs> at all. I hit you and, up on that. I was like, that was uncomfortable to listen to. Yeah, it really was. And uh, so, but I had a guy that basically, uh, you know, he basically just cuts everything out. Like, he's he's really anal retentive about the way everything sounds. So he, he basically cut that 90-minute interview into a 45-minute interview that sounded great. Sometimes, like, and, and I'll, I'll ask you this question, too. So sure. I know I get asked, what's your reach for the podcast? And it's a very hard question to ask because, I mean, what's the reach of anything? Uh, there are so many outside variables as to what your reach is organically versus, you know, outside variables that you don't really have a whole lot of control over. And so part of me sometimes wanted to be like, what's my reach? It's good enough for the WWE to hear about my fucking podcast and to get it, a song taken away from Kill Switch Engage, which is arguably one of the bigger bands in that scene. So... I don't know how big is my podcast. How big is the reach of my podcast? Because it's a stupid question, and I feel really dumb talking to grown adults about Facebook likes and the my reach and all this kind of stuff. But it's yeah. the nature of the beast. So, kind of flipping the question, I guess, a little bit back onto you. How do you do? You have to deal with these same things, like, or is your name kind of just? Do people actually look at the quality of your work and the content of your work versus what you do? like your 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 youtube reach or whatever they want to say yeah that's that yeah another great question man uh, it's funny the the quality of the interviews i feel like are are way better than my quality of the interview is so that's something i struggle with a lot i don't know if i'm answering your question going on limb here but um yeah anyway uh, yeah so i i don't really know how to answer your question um the the reach um probably I, it's it's growing. Uh, well, YouTube views not necessarily trying to get into your your numbers, but I mean, just like more so. Do you have to deal with publicists who are like, okay, Scott, you want X guest? Tell me a little bit about your show. What is your reach? Do you get that question when you're trying to get a guest? So yeah, that's great. Uh, when I talk, I actually don't have to. Publicists don't really. I don't. I don't go down that lane. Obviously, uh, not obviously, but uh, uh, <laughs> what I mean is, I didn't mean to say obviously. Um, I deal with like their their managers and stuff like that. I really don't deal with publicists that much. Um, I and and the, another thing is um, with my show and the past few artists I've had have always been through like like I interviewed. Good example. I've interviewed Mikey from Islander, mm-hmm. the singer of Islander. Yep. Mikey says, hey, I'm friends with 
Ted from Corn. Do you want me to reach out to him? I say sure. Yes. Then and then he gets on my show. That's the easiest thing to do for me. And then like like Jose, I'm friends with Jose. You want me to, you want me to text him? Sure. Jose say he'll be on your show. So, but the biggest thing for my show is is making friendships and then them referring me to other people. It's so much easier than dealing with like publicists and. Um, I've I've dealt with uh, I I've dealt with like managers in the past. I say managers, I don't know what to call them. Maybe publicists too, but uh, but it's so much easier dealing with like people that are just refer you. As, hey, I got a buddy, you know, he'll love to be on your show. I definitely can concur with that. I mean, I've been able to do that with Dan for his podcast when some of the guests he's gotten. It's like, hey, I have a personal contact friendship with that person. I can probably get him on your thing. So it's definitely it's easier when thing, it's so much easier when that's the case. But like right now. I've been working at getting Sean Morgan from Seether, and it looked good for Louder Than Life. Then I basically was like, hey, Louder Than Life fell through. Uh, Seether's coming here to Grand Rapids. Uh, is there any way I can get Sean to do you know, whatever amount, 15, 20 minutes that you're going to give me there? And I have to resubmit all of my information again, and I was like, oh, my God. It's still in the it's same so thir- – it's still – and the worst part is is I just piggybacked off of the actual email that we already went on. I was like, hey, in light of this, like, is there any way we can do this? <laughs> and I was like, so I, I almost wanted to be a dick and be like, refer to like three emails up and all the information you requested still there. But I resubmitted um, everything. <laughs> John 5. Oh, man. So he's... I reached out, reach out to his publicist and they said uh, after uh, – I can't remember exact words. After further reviewing your show and – and everything they said, um, well, keep you in mind, just we, we need you to be a little basically. My show needs to be a little bigger, yep. <laughs> we need to have a little more people on there. Yeah. And I was just very full of rejected. I was like, ah, oh, that stinks. Oh, I've started yeah, to, res- I resorted now to uh, name dropping who I like bands I've had on because I figure if that's not going to get me anywhere, then when I'm when can I start doing that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, see, I'm definitely more like Scott in that regard, it's always friends of friends or. I'll find somebody on Facebook or, you know, something along those lines. Like John does all the, all the legwork, uh, on, on this podcast. <laughs> um, yeah, every day is leg day. Uh, but, uh, no, like he, cause for us, I mean, some of the people that we got on our other podcast was just like, it's so funny because it's so weird how it all gets thrown together because basically people either ignore you completely outright or they are just like literally just like okay sounds fun you know um and we also come across come at it from a whole we're not actually going to interview you like ask you any personal questions we're just gonna you know have you pick a band and talk about that but almost every single time it seems like we'll talk about the band and then like the last half hour is just like a regular interview or you know just guys talking and stuff like that but uh yeah like as far as the publicists and stuff go um i don't deal with them because i don't have i don't have as much class as john does like so if i if i ask somebody you know if, if hey do you want to you know can we get your artist on or whatever or like no your podcast is not big <laughs> enough or you're not you know like i'm probably going to respond in such a way that they will never even give us a chance even if we become the biggest podcast in the world you know do they say that to you though they say your podcast not big enough they don't but... say it directly it's funny too because i appreciate the people that do say it directly yeah. Oh, yeah. it's you... just like oh, okay this guy's a straight shooter so when i get a little bigger i can come back and you know ask again um usually it's one of those like like john was saying well what's your reach I don't know. Like, I know that, like, people download the show. I've never been asked that like, question, you know? by the way. Yeah, like, we know that, no, like, I, I know that people download the show, but, like, I don't know how many of those are actual people. Like, I had I had somebody, my wife went to play volleyball last night, and a person on her volleyball team said, like, yeah, I don't listen to your husband's podcast, but when I'm on my lunch break, I hit play, so he gets the download. So it's, like, th- there's really no easy way to, like, know what your actual quote unquote reach is like, it's, it's such a loaded question, but that's what they go off of. Like they just, if they can get cold, hard numbers out of you, that's what they do. Yeah. It's, uh, it's definitely frustrating. Um, I think I've, I've shared emails with Dan that I get where it's just like, you know, just fucking come right out and say like, (laughs) instead of telling me that so-and-so is not doing interviews. And then obviously I see, that person doing a ton of interviews it's like why don't you just tell me that they're not going to do an interview with me because i'm not on the level of these other things these other 
publications or distribution avenues. Uh, because you know what? I will respect and understand that way more. But when you tell me he's not doing interviews and then I see at least 20 interviews shared between the publicity firms, Facebook pages and socials and such, and the band and the people sharing these interviews, it's like, well, uh, that's a lie. <laughs> so, and a lot, and a lot of times I just want to like copy and paste, like send screenshots of all these things, send it to him and go, I thought they weren't doing any press. This seems like an awful lot of press for someone who's not doing any interviews. Uh, must've misunderstood what you meant, or maybe these were all done, uh, before my interviews, even though some of these were done at venues after the fact of when I was trying to do one, but Hey, whatever. Yeah. That, that's crazy. Like when you say stuff like that, it's, it's amazing because you, we're basically, this is a free service and something that we're passionate about. So it's the, the big question is like, what drives you guys to, to keep going when you deal with all that stuff? You know what I mean? I mean, this is. We're not getting even paid. We get you. I mean, you guys may have Patreons and stuff, but it's it's, it's one person and it's my friend. <laughs> <laughs> That's more than I have. So <laughs> okay. Well, I, I mean, love I love all my Patreon subscribers. Okay. <laughs> I don't even I don't even know if Dan's uh, Dan's fan base comes over and listens to him on this. To be completely honest, um, I post it. Oh no, um, I, I understand that, I but I mean, yeah. I I would I be interested know. to find what people who solely came over for you because of you i would be interested to find or find out what they think of this show overall yeah there's there's been a few and i always ask but it always turns out that they're like listen to one well i'm listening to this one or you know it's it's hard it, it is so dreadfully hard and this could actually go into another topic entirely but it's really hard to get actual legitimate feedback from people i think they just you don't want to bum you out Right, like if it's terrible, you know, or they hate it, or they didn't really listen to it, but they said they did just to make me feel better, or or whatever it is, um, it's hard, you know, because I will ask direct questions like that, like, you yeah. know, hey, um, what did you think of the show, you know, yeah. and it's always like they either change the subject immediately or, you know, don't really want to get into it at all, and like, yeah, and that's what it's been like for ours, um. And I'm I'm don't want to ask a listener that I don't know that's like not my friend to be like, well, how come you don't listen to John's podcast or do you listen to John's podcast or or whatever? Mm-hmm. But I mean, on the flip side of that, though, a lot of people have gone to our podcast just for me being on this one, you know, so that's how yeah, that's how what I did. Yeah. 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 There's some there's Sorry. some trickle Sorry. down effect there. That's all I was going to say. What has so, been I mean, because you're you're solely on. I mean, I guess technically you have it on your website, but I was going to say you're, you're solely basically on YouTube where you have very, uh, I'll say, fickle, uh, to put it nicely. You have very fickle people who will come and basically just comment on whatever. So given that that's how that medium is, have you been pleasantly surprised at the overwhelming positive feedback to your interviews? Yes. And and that kind of um... – when when Dan was talking, I was thinking about that because it's I, I feel like I don't want to surround myself with yes people and yeah yeah everything everything you're doing is great but that seems like I don't know if I'm answering your question but it seems like every interview I do I constantly get this enormous feedback of yes that's amazing yes your I love your interview but I'm super critical on that and I don't think I don't agree with them you know I'm like this I could have been better that wasn't that good the public is our our boss indirectly, I guess, Um, since we're in a content creating thing. But it's like, I don't know. I think it would be very disingenuous for someone to be like, well, I'm not going to read the negative comments because whatever. You know, I've I've been kind of blessed with that because my brother, (laughs) I invite him to almost every interview I do. And he tells me like it is. (laughs) It's pretty funny because everybody's like, oh, that's amazing. It's a great interview because I always hear that. And then my brother would be like, yeah, you kind of he, – you asked him a question and he gave you the an answer. Then you kind of just asked him again. <laughs> and so like, <laughs> he gives me this like really direct feedback of like, if you weren't my brother, I'd want to beat you up right now. <laughs> so it's good that, that – yeah, I'm, I'm glad to have him to help me. But Well, I think it's different right, with man. a podcast. <laughs> you know, it is. It's different yeah. on a podcast though than like being a musician or, you know, because with a, as a musician you've got like a certain vision – that you have, you know, for how you want things to go. 
But on a podcast, I mean, you can you can plan as much as you want to plan, but there's really no way to make it perfect. Uh, I keep trying to tell my co-host of my other show this all the time. Like, there's there's no perfect podcast out there that's like a hundred percent, you know, going to be amazing because of the unpredictability of speaking to another person, you know, that's not yeah. you. And also, as far as the feedback stuff goes, like, I definitely stopped looking at the download numbers. That was the one thing that I was used to be really concerned about, and now I don't care as much because in the beginning I was super disappointed because, you know, whenever you first start anything, nobody downloads it, nobody listens to it, you know. <laughs> and I'm in two years later, and in, in that department I'll pay, I'll pay loose attention to it and be like, wow – but now I can come at it from like a wow we're doing a lot better than we were two years ago you know, and just go from there. But like, with uh, with the whole feedback thing you know with Facebook reviews and and iTunes reviews and all this kind of stuff that podcasters seem to care about so much, is that you know we're not rock stars so we also want to seem like we're involved with the community. You know we try to make a podcast into a community. You want it to be an open forum. You want people to be able to comment on your episodes, give their opinion and things like that, and feel free enough to do that. And part of that is giving a little bit of credence to even some of the negativity. Like we recently had, or I recently had a, you know, got a semi negative review on our podcast. And it was the very first one we'd ever gotten. Um, and I was like freaking out. Cause I was like, Oh man, it's a negative. It's blah, blah, blah. blah. And then I was like, well, it's a little constructive. Um, it wasn't worded great, but you know, and I thought, <laughs> I thought, well, like, let's, you know, we should, and my, my other co-host said, you know, well, let's, let's do a rebuttal or let's, you know, respond to it and say this. And eventually, you know, we, we ended up doing, we just, every time we get our iTunes review, we read it on the podcast because people like that. Um, mm -hmm. And this was a negative one. So instead I just read the negative review on the podcast That's awesome. and, yeah, and just said, cool. Hey, thanks. Thanks for your honesty. And we moved on. And like, then like John was saying, because yeah, the the public is our boss, and we have to kind of roll with the punches and show that you know, hey, just letting you know, I know you didn't say something nice about us, but we wanted to let you know that you did, we did listen to you, and we'll take you know whatever we can take out of that. Um, so my question is this: No, nope, you didn't so sign. When <laughs> <laughs> so when you're done with a podcast, people like so my video. When I do these web shows, people that I interview, I guess they uh, – it's like they know cameras are on, so they're going to put on a – I'm not trying to say maybe a persona. They're just – They're on. They're camera ready. So Yeah, they're on. Doing a, a, a podcast, these people are just talking to you, and they don't, you know, they don't care what they look like. They don't care whatever – I wonder, like, just how different that is when you're doing when you're conducting an interview. Because I feel like when I'm doing my interviews, people are probably on their best behavior. They don't want to look stupid because they got three cameras rolling on them. I don't know. This is kind of a weird question, but when you were to tell me that, I was I was thinking about that. You know, I mean, I was just wondering how different that would be if I did an interview the exact same style, going through every album, but no cameras on you, and you just just your voice. You know. Well, I mean, that's not I mean, a question. I've seen, that's more of a statement. I've seen, I mean, I've heard people get like really chummy with John. Like, I mean, just really to the point of just like they start talking to him and it's like a 45 minutes passes. And now it's like, I'm not talking to this podcaster that I met. I'm talking to an old friend, you know? So, and, so if uh, you had cameras on John while he's doing this, do you think like how different that would be? conversation wise you know? i'm gonna tell you this and this isn't to to boost me up you i could go grab my wife right now and because she sees this happen in the wild quote unquote all the time my wife is just like people will just tell you the most random shit like about themselves like that <laughs> like in theory no one should tell like yeah you know the first time i met my wife and we went on our first date like no one's gonna tell you that story randomly at a bar but like she goes people will just tell you these things so I don't know. I've a lot of my friends. I know it's a, it's a gift and a curse. Like I can talk, obviously, uh, to just about anyone about a lot of things. Um, but for whatever reason, I I have this gift that people will just kind of open up to me. Dan would be a better one to ask because even though I listen to these interviews and I prep for him, maybe Dan can hear the intangible that is not having me involved in it from my perspective. But I feel like maybe I just find <coughs> the humanity to ask these questions out of people. I, I don't know. I guess yeah, I... like like guess um like like Dan was talking about the uh, 
the interview you had before where the person maybe seemed, I don't know, angry or, or whatever, kind of out of it. Um, <laughs> if, if he had, I'm not, I'm not naming names, but if he had, John interviewed uh, that guy too. <laughs> okay. Oh no, he's well, talking about the other one that just. Re- my, I'm not trying to stretch my question out anymore. I'm sorry, but if, if if we had cameras on that guy, would he? Would you guys still have the same interview with? Him? I would have the same interview. I think. I think I have a way of kind of taking people out of whatever is happening around them, making it feel like a legit, genuine conversation, face to face, looking at each other. Uh, typically, you know, they can see my notes, so they know I've spent time. So it's not just like, oh, here's this person asking some bullshit and wasting my time. And, yes. okay. you know, and a lot of times, like, if you go back and listen to the Jaden Panesso episode I did from Siler, it's like within the first three minutes, I was like, dude, I'm just tossing my questions. Let's have a conversation. Let's go. And to me, I think when you can do that and just talk to someone, I think it brings – any of that, oh, there's something on me. Because, I mean, I don't have cameras on me, but that doesn't mean, like, they're the most vulnerable thing is at, at that point is, is on is their voice. They, the only essence that makes them them is, is the thing that is being captured at that point. So you can hear the fear or the nervousness or whatever. I think it's more raw and vulnerable to do an audio format interview than it would be to do an inter- like a thing because I can tell you to shoot me from this way up or hey don't don't shoot me from the waist down and then I can have my or waist up and I can have my hands below my waist and I can play with something because I'm nervous like you you can't do that with your voice um true uh, so the thing for point. me is I think if we were to do a podcast or do a video based interview I think personally I could get people to do exactly what they do on this podcast because I I think that's the intangible I have. Um, I think Dan could get there too because I think he has that same capability and, and those qualities about him where he can just get people to start talking uh, about whatever. And sometimes I, I wonder for you, I, I, I sometimes wonder, I feel like you would maybe benefit from doing a, this version of it because I feel like sometimes <laughs> – it's there's been a few times when I'm like I don't I don't know if it's just the edit that's itself where I feel like it stays on you a little bit like a half second too long where you're just like or like someone's like okay you're oh, you're on ca- you're on camera you said that. The, you're on camera too but now we're switching to the wide and like so now you guys should both be kind of looking at us I don't know if you guys do it treat it like that where it's like okay here's your hard camera here's your hard camera here's the wide and then you both should look at this but to me sometimes I feel like in the edit I'm like ah they should have panned away from too long. yeah a little bit too long and to me I think that that's what uh what can create a little bit more is like because I feel like there's a lot of visual stuff that you have to take into a consideration while you're trying to do an interview whereas i don't have to deal with any of that and so to me that would be I'm, more I'm like winking at the camera like you know, <laughs> that little yes next question <laughs> yeah but then what if they leave it in and then like people are on youtube like what's with the creepy winks that are going on <laughs> and they add this... sound effects I, actually right. that's a, that's a good John's question Auto podcast told me to do that so how uh how involved are you in the editing process of your videos uh, not at all really actually, don't even know i don't even know the editor's name I don't even know who edits the, the my good company episodes. Oh so, my god, that would drive this, me nuts. I couldn't do that. So, this is actually a, 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 a loaded answer. I don't know, but um, a, I, I've had two different people film my show. So the first ten episodes was a guy named Dustin Blake, um, and then I used um, I met a guy named Nathan Mowry who films DDP Yoga and kind of became friends with him realized he was a better fit for the show right so he, he's the next 12 episodes that you've seen and the show's gotten insanely better just it, uh, i love working with him he's great he's got his own crew and he's got his own editor guy i don't even know him i don't even know his name they send it off um we also had rich ward do my intro song so which was nice because before we used to like go um, like i'd be like oh i'm interviewing Brian Welch from Corn. So let's do Blind. Let's do that as the intro song. But what I found out is the copyright issue. Um, so I, I got my own song, Good Company. So that's that plays on every episode. Anyway, I'm, I'm rambling. Should have had to be Bad but, Company. Well, what's funny is uh, <laughs> what's funny about the copyright thing is um, I know I keep bringing up my other podcast. I've only been on John's podcast for a few months, so. A lot of my podcast experience or stories that I share are usually about the other podcast. 
and uh that was one of the biggest things for us was the uh was the copyright and because we upload yeah, all of our stuff stupid. to youtube as well but it's weird because we never get copyright strikes we've only ever gotten one or two copyright strikes and the reason for that is because we if you've listened to our episodes you know where we play the band that we're talking about like we play a random selection of songs from that band while we're yeah, having a discussion like it just Bride, makes it sound yeah, yeah yeah it just makes it sound a little bit cooler you know what about and, to uh, me to me does full songs like he used to talk to me. Like he used to do full songs for. But he's not on YouTube. No, oh, he yeah. he does the thing that I thought about doing, which is you just put little snippets and then include the link to the episode. But I tend to find that it's like if you're going to try to get someone on a thirty second to two minute clip from the episode with a link, it's like chances are they're not going to listen. They're not going to click that link, so you might as well throw the whole thing up there. And which is great because like my there are some episodes that I have that ha- and have not been downloaded very well. Uh, as far as the audio thing, but on YouTube are like 3,000 downloads or 3,000 views. And wow. it's like, all right. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. And the way we got around the copyright was, uh, we just talk over it. Like we talk over the music because how these copyright bots work is they just, they check for like certain familiar waveforms for like, uh, copyrighted works. And we never, our waveforms never the same because our voices are talking over the audio. And so, like, and nobody ever picks it up. We only ever got strikes where, like, Joe accidentally played, like, 15 full seconds of a intro or something for, like, a dramatic, like, a dramatic pause or something. And then that got flagged. And then all we had to do was take out that, like, little, we had to take, like, eight seconds out of it and it was fine. Um, but yeah, like, that, the copyright thing is hard. Because especially if you're if you're trying to get like paid for views and stuff, if you get any copyright strikes, they don't pay you anything for for your video, even even if it's got like you know two hundred twenty thousand views or, or whatever. You know, um, if they if they hit you at all on a copyright strike, you're pretty much dead in the water. You know, something I think that's that would be very hard for me. Like I know how it is for us to have to sit on interviews outside of that like i kind of pride myself on the fact now that we've caught up because i was way ahead of with content which is why we started going to two episodes a week but the thing is is i know you have interviews that you've done already but i feel like it'd just be so frustrating where you're like i did this interview and here's some shots of it and then it's like but it's not out for like two months maybe due to how you schedule your stuff out is it kind of frustrating to like know you had a good chat and you're like ready for it to be out but like you just you got to sit on it for a little bit just due to dude yes dude that's awesome man i'm glad you brought that up um with um with nathan and his crew now they're pretty consistent with every two weeks but it does stretch and and it does man like if i had a podcast i know if i had a great chat i could post this up you know i don't know how many days it takes you guys but you just said but um yes that does drive me nuts sometimes like i know one time our editor uh went on vacation so I was like, oh, this is taking forever. But, you know, yeah, well, definitely. I wish it was a, like kind of like we do the interview and it's going to be out tomorrow. Yeah, it does stink sitting on it. You know what, though? Nothing compares to this. I interviewed Chris Jericho in January of January 2018, and it's still not out yet. <laughs> I was going to say, wow. I thought like, you, you've so interviewed him, but I, I haven't seen it. Yeah, and and Rich Ward told me he'd listen to it, too, and he said he loved it. So, yeah, so I was like, man, is this thing ever going to come out? But, yeah, so. Gotta love it. Kind of in, uh, in wrapping up, um, what are some of the guests that you – what are, like, your, your, your bucket list guests at this point? I'm glad you asked that. My bucket list right now would be two people. <laughs> Dave Grohl. Oh, yeah. I love that. I love Foo Fighters. I love what he's done with that band. Absolutely love him. Or James Hetfield. It's those two. Like, I'm just like, I'll never get those guys, but it's a, it, it, it's a bucket list. Never know, man. What, what, just, would be, what would be, if you could ask Dave Grohl and James Hetfield one question each, what would it be? Oh, that's good. That's like a thinker. I got to think about it, man. For, for Dave Grohl, right when you said that, I, I immediately thought if Nirvana, if, if Kurt Cobain never killed himself and after in utero, what would the next Foo Fighter, I mean, what would the next Nirvana album would have been? Like what direction or 
I've always wondered that, like, did you ever do anything after that recording wise or talking wise or what was Kurt really like? Scott, where can people find you on the socials? The website is scottgoodcompany.com. Also, I'm on um, YouTube. I think you just basically do Good Company Bowling. Uh, and then Facebook, uh, Good Company Bowling. Every, all this is Good Company Bowling because originally the show was called Good Company with Bowling. <laughs> um, and I was told that's not a good name. You need to drop the bowling part. And I never fixed the bowling part. So, yeah. So if you ever want to find me, you can find me on all social media. Um, just good company. And if you throw in bowling, you will find me. Bowling for compliments. Bornhub.com slash yeah. good company with bowling. <laughs> Got it. Exactly. Lastly, we always like to end these episodes out with a song. So what would you like us to play it out to? Uh, and if you say frantic, I'm going to say, say no. Absolutely. I got it right now. Because I said Dave Grohl is my bucket list. This is a call. My Foo Fighters. Done. That's it. Perfect. So that was our chat. Yes, that's correct. As you heard, Dan was also on that conversation, so I don't need to ask him what he thought of it, because he was there. But Garbage. What What did you think of it? Because that's the question I usually ask you to get into this part of the, the outros. No, I thought it was a lot of fun. It was a really kind of a peek behind the curtain kind of podcast and those are always kind of those are always more fun uh when we get to just talk to somebody that has a very different approach than we do and uh i think it's cool man like i'm uh i've I've watched the show a lot and so it's just kind of fun for me you know anytime he skypes in or whatever to see him at the bar and everything now his cell phone doesn't have quite as good a video quality as his actual show does but you know the full effect was there yeah, it's. I gotta say, it's it's a bit of a trip to realize that that's that's just at his disposal, <laughs> that whole area. Like, I mean, I I think I have like you know a nice office and you know nice areas in in my house, but I don't have something that's almost like someone. Like, I mean, if you were to think of like, okay, let's let's create the perfect backdrop for this kind of a show. I don't think a set designer could even come up with all of that to just be so perfectly the the man cave type thing with all of his, you know, adornments and so forth. It's like, I think it's just fucking crazy. Like vinyl that, records and booze. It's perfect. Yeah. I mean, it's more or less like I have the hobo version of that here in my office, but <laughs> right. But, you know, it, it's just kind of interesting. And, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's kind of fun to, do different episodes you know like you were saying uh than we typically do just to kind of be fun and i definitely would think like if i were just getting into podcast or i wanted to even do a web series I, th I think there was a lot of interesting information that you were able to to get from all three of us i think you know as i had kind of said in the intro you know we all do different things with our shows they're all unique unto themselves but there is a, quite a bit of similarities and you know what works for me doesn't work for scott doesn't work for you but maybe something that works for you like is something that we can all learn from or whatever and so i think it's it's just like i said it's it's just a nice behind the scenes kind of thing and uh you know i want to thank scott for coming on because i mean dude doesn't need to fucking come on my show yeah man he's he's killing it um on his own and uh yeah, man. I always good to talk to Scott. I had him on my show a while back, and uh, it was good. You've had him on your show twice. Oh yeah, I had. Yeah, because it was we so nice. To you him had him on twice. Yeah, we had uh, we had we had him on for the Rocket Pot Expo, and that one was in person. So we got to drink beer together, and it was fantastic. What is it like? It was like nine into... in the morning, but you know what are you gonna do? What was it like looking at such a, a beautiful man in person? Oh, it was fantastic. I have several pictures of the moment. I think I would have turned uh, to stone. You a, probably might a have. A part of. A part of me would have. Absolutely. Yeah. You'd have been like, dude, is somebody filming us? Like, where are you at? What are you doing? Where's your film crew? <laughs> <laughs> like, that blew, that, that blew me away, man. Just the concept of having a crew at all. But yeah. yeah at the same time, you know, my, my heart goes out to you, John, because you do all the editing and everything yourself or whatever. In a lot of ways, like it's almost like steps up the ladder. Like John's down here, like grinding it all out, doing it himself. And then, like on my podcast, I'm just like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I show up and talk every week, but you know, Joe does all the work, right? And then Scott's like 
I got a whole camera crew that films everything <laughs> and edit edits it. everything. Yeah. And yeah, it's like, wow, dude. <laughs> like, I thought I was king awesome on the block, but that is clearly not the case. I mean, too, like when you get people like Jose Mangan and, and Eddie Trunk, two people who are like just fucking legendary, like for being for doing this basically on a way bigger scale. And oh, you know, yeah. in Eddie Trunk's case, you know, has been for 30 some odd years. It's like, to you know, just to me to be able to get someone like that, I think really speaks to what Scott's doing over there. Like just the, the level of, of professionalism, you know, because Eddie Trunk and Jose aren't going to fucking waste their time with like nobody. Like they're not going to go all the way. Like if I were to be like, hey, Jose, hey, Eddie, I want you to come down to Grand Rapids, Michigan and sit in my office and have a conversation with me for like a half hour, 40 minutes. Yeah, or actually, it'd be longer than that because you probably got to do makeup, hair, like get everything squared away, different camera angles, so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, at that point, it's like you're probably literally spending a day with this person. And to yeah. me, it's like you know, like I've made the comment in doing this podcast, you know, with you a handful of times. I don't know if I've said it on record, but I know I've said it in general. But it's like the experience that I get to have, or we get to have with these people that come on. I mean, even if you paid for a meet and greet, you're still not getting what we're getting you're not getting that experience yeah yeah so to me it's like you know the fact that we're able to do this thing and you know dan's kind of made me realize like not everyone can do this uh even though i would say contrary like i think everyone can do this um and i think everyone should uh for various reasons but beside that i think it's uh it's one of those things where you know when you see someone like scott who's able to get someone like an eddie trunk or jose mangan you know all these people and you know to me if you're able to to get those people and be able to have them stay interactive with you for that length of time and creating good good content like that speaks so highly to the professionalism and just how well scott prepares for these interviews but i I think uh you know that's that's really as good as any i mean you know we've been pumping up scott's show uh so if you are not familiar with it good company with bowling we'll get right to the plugging part of this uh if you would like to follow him you can find him on facebook at good company with bowling Instagram is Scott Good Company. Uh, he has a somewhat defunct Twitter page. I strongly encourage him to get another one if he doesn't already, because uh, Twitter's where it's at, yo. And just uh, send him like 400 DMs on Twitter, so it destroys whatever email account he has attached to it, <laughs> and then he'll start using his Twitter again. Just try it. Yeah, and then uh, you can find him on YouTube at uh, Scott Bowling Good Company. Simple enough. And uh, you can go to his website as well, ScottGoodCompany.com. Keep up with everything going on. Uh, Scott and his team do a really good job of uh, posting clips from upcoming episodes, keeping you uh, a foot of who's coming on. Um, dude's just kind of, like I said, killing it on all platforms. And uh, God forbid if uh, he actually ever decides to turn them into audio podcasts because then we're all fucked. Um, then we're dead. Yeah, basically. All that aside, though, if you would like to keep up with our show partner at Moshpit Nation, you can find them at moshpitnation.com. Follow them on Facebook at Moshpit Nation West Capital MI. Twitter and Instagram are simply Moshpit Nation. And if you would like to keep up with our show sponsor, The Bean Bastard, you can find them on thebeanbastard.com. Twitter and Instagram are also simply The Bean Bastard. And Dan, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me on Facebook under Daniel Terry, or you can find it under the discography discussion page. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Discuss Metal Dan, and uh, you could even probably send me an email at DiscussMetalDan at gmail.com, or you can send uh, the podcast an email. Basically, the whole deal of it is that if you want to get a hold of me, I'm right here. And if you would like to keep up with all things the podcast, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at John's Entitled Podcast. Tweet at us at John's Entitled Pod and email us at John's Entitled Pod at gmail.com. And we're going to end the episode as we always do with a song. And as you heard Scott say, he wanted us to play it out to Foo Fighters, This Is a Call, which is a fucking great song off of a great record. So do yourselves a favor, crank this motherfucker up. This is a call, and we will talk to you next time.